Hey guys, so I did want to give you guys one other example of a hypothesis test for one proportion Z test. Um, remember, we're going to go through lots of different types. So I'm going to try to do some examples on here for you guys. Um, I may also post some practice questions for you to try on your own. But idealistically, what you would do is you would open this video just like this, and then you would pause on this screen and go ahead and try working through this whole question on your own. That means creating the full seven step process all the way down to having your p-value, deciding if you reject or fail to reject the null, and writing out your conclusion. So if you wanna go ahead and pause this now, you can try doing all of those on your own, see if you can do it on by yourself. Um, if not, then you can continue watching and you'll see how I go through, cool? All right, <clears throat> let's get started. It says, in a rural area, only about 30% of wells that are drilled find adequate water at a depth of 100 feet or less. A local man claims to be able to find water by dousing, using a forked stick to indicate where the well should be drilled. You randomly check with 80 of his customers and find that 27 have wells less than 100 feet deep. What do you conclude about his claim? So here's the deal. This guy claims he can walk around with a wood stick and tell you where you should to you should drill down a well to get a lot of water. He claims that using his little fork stick and whatever magic way he has of doing it, he is able to pick this better than like some type of machine or just randomly picking. So it says that regularly, 30% of the wells that are drilled find adequate water. We look at his customers. Now, we just look at 80 of his customers. We would assume he has a lot, lot more. Um, and we find that 27 of those 80s were able to accomplish that. Now, the first thing we might want to do is just so we have an idea of like what we're comparing here is 27 out of 80 is actually what as a percent. Just so we can kind of talk a bit. Um, that would be our P hat. That is the sample proportion of success. So 27 out of the 80 is going to be 33.75%. So 33.75%. That means it came out as being 0.3375. Now, that kind of just helps me be able to talk about this. This guy essentially says this little stick is better than whatever way they're currently using. The current way is 30%. Him using his stick, the sample we got, 33%. So is 33% large enough of a difference for us to say he's better? Or is it just that we had a lucky sample of customers from him? So that 3.75% difference really isn't that big of a deal. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, obviously, since we are dealing with the probability of success here, and then we have a sample of the probability of success as well, this first question we are doing is indeed a one proportion Z-score test. Um, I guess we could erase that and write that a little bit better, but it is a one proportion Z test. Now, when we are doing these types of questions, you want to make sure you're writing all of this out. On the AP test, any amount of work you do, the more you write out, the more points you're going to be able to get. So when I give you the seven steps, I don't mean for you to do those in your head. I mean for you to write out the entire thing. One of the things they check in the AP test is, did they list the name of the test? This would be step one. One proportion Z test got it done. Now, if we want to use the one proportion Z test, we have to make sure we fulfill our conditions, which we'll do now. So one proportion Z test, we said those conditions, there were three of them. Um, it was whether or not we're random. It was the, uh, let's see, 10% rule. And the last one was the success fail. All right, so are these checked or not? Is this a random sample? Well, it says that you randomly check with 80 of his customers, so random solid. 10%, this is actually the one that we can't really prove one way or the other because we don't know how many total customers he has. So whenever you're unsure of something, you have two options. You can either try to assume it's true, um, hoping that maybe you just don't understand the question enough and he would obviously have 800 or more customers, 
Um, or the other thing you can always say is if you ever fail a condition, you can put a question mark next to that condition and then simply say that we will proceed with caution. And if you write the proceed with caution, the AP reader will know, hey, they were unsure of this condition. Um, so they, they obviously understand that they were supposed to check it, but they don't really know if it's true or not. So it looks like they're proceeding with caution. That is the key phrase you always wanna use, proceed with caution, proceed with caution. You'll see it pop up a whole bunch of times. Anytime we're unable to for sure do it, we say proceed with caution. The reason we don't just stop is because if you just stop, then you're gonna lose all of those points on the AP test because if you were supposed to proceed and you didn't, you now have no chance of making up the points. But if you were supposed to note that they failed a condition so this may not be accurate, you've actually covered yourself by saying, look, I know that I'm not sure about this one, so I'm just going to proceed with caution anyway, then you can guarantee you'll get all your points. So that's kind of the phrasing we use there. The last one we have is the success fail condition. Now remember, this states that if you do the probability of success times your sample size, that it needs to be bigger than 10, and your probability of failure times the sample size needs to be bigger than 10. So what is our probability of success? It's 30%, so we'll do the 0.30, all right, so 0.30 times the sample size, which was 80, um, and that's gonna give us 24. Multiply that by 80. That's gonna give us 24. Um, and then we're gonna do the opposite of the probability of success, which is probability of failure, so 0.70 times 80, and that's going to give us 56, all right? So both of those are bigger than 10, which means we do indeed pass the success, success fail condition. So that means um, we've now mentioned all three of our conditions. We mentioned which test we're using, which means now we can dive into actually breaking down the pieces of this and putting it into our calculator. So let's get ready by clearing off some of this. So we can write down the information that we know where we'll need. So first things first, let's write out our HO and HA. All right, so HO, HA, um, our null and alternative hypothesis. All right, so we got those on there. So in this case, we're dealing with proportions. So the letter over here on the left-hand side is gonna be P. Remember, this will change later on, but as of the moment, still dealing with proportions. We said that our null hypothesis is always equal to, um, and we'll come down to this in a second, but what are we equal to? Remember, this is always the assumed to be true. So what is the assumed amount of correctness when someone is going about digging a well? Well, that comes from the beginning of our question right here with the 30%. So we're actually gonna put our 0 0.30 right there. That's like the default, everyone gets the 30%. But this guy claims he's better than the 30%. So in other words, what are we trying to prove to be true? We're trying to prove that he is better than the 30%, all right? So he's bigger than the 30%. Now, in our sample, we've already seen that he's at 33, so he did better through that sample of people, but is this enough of a difference for us to claim he's better than the norm? Um, so let's go ahead and look through now and see what we see. Uh, we got that, that, we got to write out the rest of our info. So what things will our calculator look for? Our calculator will want to know what our PO is, what our X is, and what our N is. Now, the PO, remember, is just whatever it is that we put in our HO and HA. It's the P value we use for HO and HA. So that's just going to be our 0 0.30. Our X is the number of successes in our sample. In this case, we had 27 successes out of a total of 80 attempts. So realistically, this is all we're going to need for our calculator. So let's just go ahead and jump over to the calculator and start plugging this stuff in. Remember, the whole point here is that we need to know a solid p-value to use. And in this case, we have not been given a, an alpha level of significance. So we would probably just use the default of the 0.05, okay? So we were not given the level of significance. 
So we're just going to use the default one of the 0.05. So let's jump over to the calculator, see what we got. Remember, the way that you do hypothesis tests in here, you go to menu, go to statistics, and go to stat test. We have only so far dealt with one proportion Z test, but remember, we're going to do all the ones one through six. I believe we're going to work on this guy next and then jump up and start going down these. Um, so let's go ahead and jump here, one proportion Z test. We already just said our PO was 0 .30, ooh, 0 0.30. Our number of successes was what, 27? 27 and then 80, so 27, 80. For our HA, we want to prove that he is better than the PO, so greater than. So you really got to have that greater than, less than, or not equal to sign down in your mind. So if you're someone who's still messing up with the greater than, less than, now's your time to learn. Remember, alligator always eats the bigger number. So go ahead and hit OK there. There it is. There's all of our information that we need. Notice that we already found this ourselves earlier, but your P has 33.75. So that means that the probability of success in this sample was 33.75%. And it says that this should happen 23% of the time. So our P value, I'm going to move this over. I want to do the first three decimals here. So just 0 0.232. Let's go ahead and put that over here. Point two, three, two um, is our p-val. Now, at this point, we have everything we need for the question. So now it just comes down to deciding if we reject or fail to reject, and then writing our conclusion. So here's the deal. Remember, if your p-value is bigger than alpha, then we fail to reject. All right. So we would fail to reject here. Sad day. Fail to reject that hoe, which means we can't move forward. Um, but remember, if this p-value were smaller than alpha, that means that it would have been such a rare situation that we would have said, yeah, there's no way that he's the simple 30%. He must be far better. Um, but we were not below alpha in this case. So 23 was our p-value. Let's talk a little bit more about what this means, though, how we would write this out in context of the question. So. 0.23 or 23% means that if we were to go out and collect a random sample, we would accept, we would see a 33% happen about 23.2% of the time. In other words, almost one out of every four sample we take would have a probability of success this large. So this is not rare. One out of every four, this will happen. So it's possible that his 33% was only higher than the 30% because we just got a lucky sample. It is so close that we do not have enough evidence to reject that he's any better than the norm, all right? So that means if I were to type this out, let's actually type here so you guys don't hate my writing that's gonna be on there. Let's get rid of this. So how would I type out this answer? I would say, there is not enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis. So we do not believe that his dousing method is any better than the norm. All right, I want to move this over a little bit so we can see it a bit better. Um, so at the end of the day, what all should we have here? We'll see here, we now have our sentence, there's not enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis, so we do not believe that his dousing method is any better than the norm. This would be our end conclusion, our finish, our done. The reason we don't have to put all the information is because as you are going along, you should have written all this stuff out. They should know you're doing a one proportion Z test because you wrote that out and underlined it. They should know how you felt about your conditions because you wrote it out. They should know what your null and alternative hypothesis is. They should know what all of the information you plugged in was. And they should know what your calculator put out as a p-value and what alpha you used. So in this case, and the fact that we failed to reject, because I wrote it out every step of the way, I don't have to rewrite it all in my conclusion. It is all right there and they can see it. So this would be our final answer for the question. If I were submitting this for the AP test, I would make sure to submit 
all of this work. I would put this on there. I would put this and I would put this and make sure they have everything to know what it is I did for this question. So I hope this was helpful. Hope you tried it on your own first. If not, I'll go ahead and post another one for you guys to try on Schoology. With that said, guys, stay fit, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day.